So we have these two pillars of the church, Peter and Paul. And the Lord gives us this not as a feast day, but as a solemnity, because of how important they are. The very importance of Rome is because these two men found themselves in Rome, preached the gospel there in their final days, and died there. And because their blood was spilled there, that's where, in a sense, that call of Peter and Paul start and go out to the world. Peter we see especially in that call of uh, the Holy Father, which we see that institution in our gospel today, in which the Lord changes Peter's name, says, yes, you are Simon, but I will call you Peter. Peter, which means rock. And that word rock is, it's little rock built on the big rock. So it's not that Jesus is sort of pushing himself aside, but he's saying, I am still the king, that you are my prime minister. And there's this image from the Old Testament, which has the prime minister, the steward, the one who speaks in the name of the king, the king is away, off in battle or on campaign, and that steward would have a giant key that would be on his shoulder, and it would be that key that opens the door to the gates and closes the gates. Now, he doesn't do that on his own authority, but he does that through Christ. And so even in the scriptures, we see this, this institution of the, or the institution of the papacy and to see that it is a gift from God, that it is a gift that we can hold on to, that gives us a short anchor. And the gift aspect we see in both the gospel, but also in the, in the first reading, the fact that Peter doesn't use his own wits to get out of prison. You notice the whole time he's just kind of in a dream. He doesn't really even know what's going on. And it's only after he gets out that it says he comes to his senses and he says, wow, the angel of the Lord helped me through this. And there's a sign in that where the Lord wants to remind us that what the Lord does to the papacy is not necessarily dependent on just the human ability of that man or even the personal holiness of that man. If, if we think about human or just the history of the church, we know that in the midst of the, the, the papal office, there are many saints and sinners. We would be blind not to be able to see that. If you look during the Renaissance time, if you look during these times, there's some pretty rough times in the personal holiness of, of the papacy. And yet, the gift is always there. The gift of saying, I will still keep my church solid on this rock of the office of the papacy. And that's why we have to be very, very careful in the midst of a time in which, I think we see this in social media sometimes, we go too far. And even sometimes different criticisms of our current Holy Father, even Cardinal Sarah, who has mentioned, you know, he maybe has some differences in, in maybe ways of going about things, and yet he says to speak in this way against the Holy Father is to be outside of the church. And so he has this beautiful intention there of saying, yes, we can work like Peter and Paul, where there are some times where even Paul is called to, um, to speak to Peter. If you remember that part in Galatians, in which Peter has to has to grow in that, you know, in that particular witness. But notice how it's not jumping out of the church or attacking in a way that is unhealthy. And I, I think I've seen this even with Catholic bloggers, a way in which they step too far. So we have to be very, very careful. Are we truly trusting that God is God? Or are we 
putting our own human categories, saying, I know better than the church, and I know better than God's plan for the papacy. So I just encourage us to be careful of that, and to recognize that God made a promise to secure the church on the papacy as that point of unity, regardless of the person's personal holiness or not. But I think we also have to look and see the beautiful witness that our current Holy Father gives in that sense of being someone who really tries to live out that gospel of mercy, that way in which there is this, um, and Sherry Waddell, someone who um, does a lot with um, intentional discipleship, speaks about Pope Francis very, very likely having a charism of mercy, which that charism of mercy is when you see suffering and when you see pain, there is something in the heart that hurts for the hurts of others and just goes right out. And I think that's where you see this very natural impulse as, you know, he's going through a procession or he's doing something like that. He sees someone in need. And all of a sudden, he just stops everything. He just goes over there, and he just embraces that person. I think there's a beautiful witness there for us to see in that call of being led by mercy. So I just, I give that to you in this time of a difficult, divisive climate within our church, to be very careful how social media can form our minds to become very impulsive, and sort of swing this way or this way and not have time to really discern, to pray, and to ultimately trust God. There's too much of a gut reaction, I think, in our society as a whole, but then also in our church as well. So be careful of that and make sure that you're rooted in prayer, rooted in Christ, and rooted in a deep love of our church. So now, these two calls, the Petrine and the Pauline. The Petrine, Peter, was called to be the one who is to be that point of unity within the church, to be that place in which he ministered primarily to the Jews, to those who were already in the midst of that covenant. That was his call. And for most of that time, he was in Jerusalem. He also went to, to Antioch. He found himself in Rome. But his main call was being that strengthening within the life of the church. Paul's call was to be a missionary to the Gentiles, to go out, to go into those areas where no missionary has gone before, to go to those particular limits Pope Francis would say the peripheries, to be able to go there and bring the gospel there. And if you think about it, both of them did different things like that. So it's not like one's this way and one's this way. There is that both and. Paul was a nurturer of his communities that he founded, so he also worked on the internal growth of the church. Peter ultimately found himself preaching in the midst of Rome. So they both did both. But there is a way in which we can learn these different roles, particularly of the, the, the clergy and the laity. And this is something um, Bishop Robert Barron in the Word on Fire Institute, I'm, I'm a member of that Word on Fire Institute, and I really, I really like a lot of the sort of way of bringing the gospel in that particular way of truth, goodness, and beauty. But one of the things that he points out is he said sometimes we ask the question, many times maybe when we're mad about something, we're mad about um, something in the church, and our kind of first thing is, bishops, what are you going to do about it? And Bishop Robert Barron kind of points out, saying, yes, there, there needs to be growth there, there needs to be courageous preaching there and guiding the people, but sometimes that's the wrong question to ask, because a lot of times we sort of put it out here, but we don't kind of ask the question, what am I going to do about it? Because he, he points out that there's two different calls 
within the ordained ministry and the laity. And they can interlap at different times, so it's not a polarization. But the primary call of the ordained ministry is the sanctification of the people of God, leading them to the sacraments, helping them grow in holiness, helping them become missionary disciples so that they become the ones that go out into society as doctors, as politicians, as lawyers, as you know, different calls of, of, of promoting the social teaching of the church, people on the front lines. Sometimes there's a way in which there's a certain passivity of saying, Father, what are you going to do about it? And that's actually a recipe of disaster because then you sort of send the one priest out or the one bishop out to, in a sense, be leavened for the world and they collapse or they're not very effective because in many ways they might not have the expertises that many of the laity have for particular spheres of influence. And so it's, it's important to see that call of really kind of going deep into the heart and saying, Lord, you have entrusted me with different experiences, different education, different strengths, different charisms. How am I called to be fed here? How am I called to be nurtured by the ordained ministry so that I can go out, so that I can go to those places like St. Paul, those places that the priest could never get into in the same way that you can. This is actually the call of Vatican II. Vatican II was not to set laity versus clergy or clergy versus laity. It was to say there are different calls, different roles, but if we truly learn, if the priesthood truly learned how to live this out, you know, and sometimes I would say, as priests, sometimes we struggle with that. We can become more the Toastmaster versus the one who leads people into the deep worship and encounter with the sacraments. So that's something that we need to pray for, is the overall holiness and purification of the priesthood to really fall in love with the sacraments on such a deep way, to fall in love with hunger to give God's mercy in confession, to fall in love with the Lord on their knees in adoration. So we need to pray for that, but we also need to pray for the mobilization of the, the laity to be able to not be afraid, but to say, the Lord has filled me with his spirit, and I'm fed here, but I'm called to go out there and be the, the hands and feet of Christ in the midst of society, wherever the Lord has called you whether that's in the arts, whether that's in the media, whether that's in law and state and all these different things, we need to have Catholics who are properly formed. I think one of the problems that we've had in the past is we've had maybe Catholics going out into some of those areas, especially the political sphere, and not being properly formed, and it becomes a disaster and a horrible witness. We need to be fed here, nourished here by the teaching of the church, and empowered to go out. Peter and Paul working together. So ask the Lord, how am I called to be Paul going out?